Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Coming up on Off 90, Craig Christensen, better known as Mr. Kite, creates breathtaking art exhibited in the unique gallery, The Sky. Rochester artist Dr. Andre Brewer merges art and science with his hauntingly beautiful x-rays of plants. We get a lesson in how to milk a cow, the old-fashioned way, by hand. And all aboard for a magical and miniature model train ride in Grand Meadow. It's time for another road trip off 90. I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. First on today's program, from his sewing machine to the sky, Craig Christensen, better known to his friends and family as Mr. Kite, crafts kites that are beautiful works of art. We get to follow his creative process from design to sky as Craig gluts his imagination soar. And as always, he's dressed in his trademark Sunday best. Okay, we're going to go this time. We're going to whip out another purple one here. There we go. Voila, we got another piece. Nice straight stitch all the way down. I just start cutting strips of fabric and start sewing them together. And the next thing you know, out comes a kite. I'm known as Mr. Kite. My real name is Craig Christensen, but uh, people all over have known me by the name of Mr. Kite, and I answer to both. live here in Webster, Minnesota, and uh, been making kites for about 20 some years. There we got wind now. It's unique in a ways, uh, but if you stop and talk to people, somewhere in their life, there's been some kites involved. They've had an uncle that's made kites or their dad used to make kites. You've always got somebody that comes up and gives you a kite story. Just give it a little tug on the line. I've had a love for flying from day one. My father was an airline pilot and uh, I was basically raised around airplanes. I got into model airplanes very heavy in the early years and it got to be just a little much. Didn't have enough time to keep putting airplanes together. So wandered into a kite shop, found some kind of neat looking kites and bought a couple hundred dollars worth of them. Then one winter day, it was way too windy to fly model airplanes and decided, well, let's get some of them kites out and see how they go, you know? Well, that was it. All of a sudden, I'm hooked. I was about 40 years old or better and uh, when I bought these kites in the, in the uh, kite shop and I got the look and uh, I thought, well, somebody else can build this stuff, I can too. This one, this is my very first one that I made right here. And so uh, mom had an old sewing machine and I dug that out and I got some fabric and it's like, oh, I can do that. I just take three or four rolls of fabric and it's the same cloth that you see on the big sailboats with the big colorful sail out in the front. You just roll along and uh, voila, you got a piece. And what we do is make just a whole pile of them and then we just keep adding them up till we get kites. There's times where I'll sit down and I'll sew for you know six or eight hours if nothing else is happening. 
and it really isn't that hard. Pretty near everything will fly. Just have to work with it a little more than some of it. A lot of my stuff is like patchwork quilt stuff or pieces of stained glass. It's the same as uh, the artist does with sculpture or painting. You know, some people paint on canvas. Well, I do fabric work and uh, it's a piece of artwork. It just isn't on canvas and it isn't hanging on a wall. It's flying in the air. Peaceful. You're out in the fresh air. You're usually out where it's, it's nice. Kite is just kind of floating around in the sky and it, uh, I always say it just that kite line just pulls the nastiness out of you and takes it off to somewhere where it needs to go. Everybody asks, where do you fly kites? Well, I fly kites anywhere, a lot in the winter. Lakes are frozen over, and most of the lakes don't have trees in them. So all of a sudden, you've got an automatically big open field with no trees. We do a lot of kite festivals in the wintertime. Clear Lake, Iowa, we do one in the middle of February, and uh, that attracts about eight, 9,000 people from five state area. It's awesome. It's awesome. And the amount of color and things that we put in the sky, we just literally filled the sky with so much color you couldn't believe. And uh, people had the best time that I've ever seen. And I've been to a lot of big kite flies all over the country. And then here we've got over 1,200 kites. And these kites don't gather dust. Some of them may have not been flown for a year or two, but somewhere along the way, they come out and get used either for a display or for a fly somewhere. When I go, go to a festival, I load a few things up because I never know what I might find for wind conditions, so I got a few spares. Well, I kind of picked up the name Mr. Kite, kind of added a little class, you know. One of the guys that I worked with says, oh, you should have a tuxedo. And it, the thing was kind of floating in the back of my mind. Well, both of my folks worked for Byerly's Grocery Store and they had their 25th anniversary and they had gotten tuxedos for all their demo people that weekend. The customers took on a whole different attitude towards the demo people. The demo people took on a whole different attitude amongst them. Uh, all of a sudden they were dressed up and they were proud of what they were doing that day. Two weeks later I had a tuxedo and uh, that was the start of the tuxedo and the top hat. I've went through three tuxedos already and on the second top hat and uh, yes, it is a mark. Okay, this first picture here is in front of Nordstrom's department store out at the Mall of America. And that part I decorated with uh, tropical fish. Just hung the place full of kites one night. That kite display was up for 10 days. And it's one of the longest displays that they've had uh, hanging at the Mall of America. And then we went and done the rotunda area, the main part of the Mall of America. And there was actually three layers of kites all the way down. And we probably hung probably close to 250 kites in that area. And it took huge kites to make a real statement in there and it did. It was absolutely awesome. No, I never grew up. I'm still just a kid. 68 going on 15 or 16. <laughs>
peekaboo. <laughs> Lifelong, yeah, desire of uh, enjoying toys. Just a kid at heart. An experiment that turned into an art. That's how you can describe the work of the late Dr. Andre Brewer of Rochester. He placed natural objects inside his x-ray machine and discovered an art form that looks like something that's out of this world. Often when they first see them, they're really puzzled by what they are because they've never really seen anything quite like it before. I uh, was attracted to these images when I saw them right away. They are a very stripped down, direct presentation of natural forms and yet they've got an elegance to them that I think uh, is, is very artistic gives us a sense of what's underneath the surface in nature and some of the beauty there. What my dad would do is create an x-ray negative. He worked with a photographic lab to take the x-ray negative and create a print, a black and white print on paper. These prints really represent a convergence of art, technology, medicine, and botany. On a scientific level, when you get down to, uh, I guess, brass tacks of everything in the universe, everything is made up of mathematics. And it's just really cool to see uh, in this artwork the natural geometry and natural uh, symmetry and geometric shapes that form that just occur naturally in living things. In a traditional medical x-ray, um, and x-rays are really large negatives. You'll notice your bones are white and the other tissues are sort of different shades of gray. And that's because the x-rays pass more easily through the softer tissues and have a harder time passing through the more dense tissues like bone. This is because somebody wanted to play around with it and make experiment with different light, different settings. and show stuff that we don't normally see every day. My dad was born in South Africa. It's a country known for its beautiful uh, flowers and plant life. And um, his mother was an avid gardener, and I think his father too. So he developed an awareness and uh, appreciation for plants early on. He received his medical degree in South Africa and it was in the early 40s. And so at that time he joined the South African Army and as part of his uh, service he uh, was sent uh, to Egypt. And on the ship from South Africa to Egypt they just so happened to have a book called The Doctor's Mayo. And he was so inspired, I guess, after reading that book that he decided to uh, try to come to the Mayo Clinic after the war, and so that's how he came to Minnesota in 1947. He studied plastic surgery, but then he ended up going into radiology once he was at Mayo Clinic. But in 1957, he and the family moved to Tucson, Arizona, and it was here that he spent most of his career. He started to do research for a book he was going to write on the history of diagnostic radiology. And in doing his research, he discovered that the early experimenters with the x-ray, they would x-ray just about anything, including flowers and shells. And uh, I guess this made a big impression on him, even though the images at that time were sort of uh, crude and cloudy. Um, he filed that piece of information away. And then in the 1960s, he received a grant to do um, a research and study on cadaver kidneys and with that came this small uh, dishwasher sized x-ray machine that you could put a specimen in and then close the door so you had no fear of escaping radiation or anything. 
So it was with this machine that he started taking x-rays of plants, shells, and bean pods. He and my mom would go for hikes in the desert around Tucson and collect all kinds of specimens that he would then come back and x-ray. And any time he took a trip to a beach, he'd be, of course, collecting shells. So we had a lot of dried plants and flowers all around the house. It was kind of interesting. My dad actually called the x-ray prints skiographs, a word which comes from the Greek words skia and graph. Skia meaning shadow and graph meaning drawing. As a photographer myself, it really takes something that I've done it lets me see what I've been photographing for years from the inside. And I just think it's fascinating and being an avid gardener even adds to the interest. So uh, knowing a lot of the plants and, and then, then to see their inner structure is, is really a kind of breathtaking experience. I find it inspiring. It's fun to look at. It's relaxing. I really enjoy the pieces that look like they have movement in them. There's a little bit of a sexiness to them. For as long as I can remember, my dad was always an um, avid gardener and uh, a member of the uh, Tucson Botanical Gardens. He'd have his mother send him seeds from South Africa and he would grow them in the garden. I went to visit a friend at the University of Berkeley in California. I was visiting the plant pathology department and I saw that someone had cut out a number of the x-ray art pieces that had just appeared in a magazine and taped them to one of the restroom walls. When I told him this, he took it as a high compliment, and he was fueled with enthusiasm for the hobby. He started doing his hobby in the 1960s, and he did it on and off for about 50 years. It's sort of funny now, looking back, that this hobby, which was very much just a sideline, something that he did for fun, has received more attention than all his work as a physician, an author, and a political activist. What really draws me to these is the in-depth look at the flowers. I've always been a lover of flowers, and I think when you walk by a flower, you enjoy it, but you don't get a chance to really look into it. And this artwork gives you a chance to see all the layers and levels that are really in a flower that you don't take the time to notice. Yeah, I think you can't help but be excited because each image is a whole new experience and you're only aware of the exterior of, of a plant or flower and if you know it you know beforehand this even makes it more interesting I think. Some of my favorite images are the tulips. The name tulip is derived from the Turkish word for turban and you can see why it could sort of look like a turban. Another favorite are the California poppies when the Spaniards saw the fields of poppies in California, they called California the land of fire in the Golden West. Another favorite are the snake's head lilies, and I just learned that these grow around here. And uh, I like this print a lot because it really shows the movement that's often associated with my dad's work. Most of the prints today are no longer the prints that one used to create in a dark room with chemicals. Once the image is digitized, you can print what's called a gicle print. And gicle is simply a French word that means to spray. So these are prints that 
really consist of ink sprayed on paper. And it's sort of amazing that they're even better and more detailed than the really high quality photographic or darkroom prints. When people see these prints, the words that are often associated with them include delicate, beautiful, alive, graceful, ethereal, haunting. I'm sure most of you are familiar with Georgia O'Keeffe and her beautiful paintings of flowers. O'Keeffe offered us wonderful views of flowers to help us really see them, and maybe these x-ray images offer yet another way to see the flowers and to know nature a little more deeply. She once said, nobody sees a flower really, it is so small, we haven't time. It takes time, to see them takes time, like to have a friend takes time. Milking a cow by hand is almost a lost art. It takes skill, patience, and a firm grip. Back on the first season of Off 90, we headed to a family farm in Sargent to get a lesson in how it's done. There's no better teacher than Jean Anderson. You've got to keep them on a schedule, a 12-hour schedule. If you get to be uh, half an hour, hour late, why? They get uncomfortable and they're wiggling around and they start mooing. It's sort of like a human uh, when you have to go to the bathroom. Uh, you don't want to wait long. I mean, when your bladder gets full, you got to empty it. And that's the way cow's udder is. If it's full, I want to get milked. This particular cow here will probably give right close to five gallons of milk. Milking a cow by hand is harder than one thinks. Uh, you don't want to go just flying right in there. You want to go in there carefully or talk to the cow a little bit so, so you don't scare them. <laughs> Otherwise, there's a good chance you'll get kicked. You have to squeeze pretty good. Pretty good. You gotta have a pretty good grip in your hand to get the milk to come out. All you need is a good set of hands and a pail and a stool. We're gonna milk this cow by hand and the best thing to do on the way in is touch him on the side. Uh, and then I'm gonna take a alcohol wipe like people use and wash off her teeth and massage her udder a little bit and within a couple minutes her milk will be there ready to be milked. Just put your hand on there and then you gotta squeeze it. Squeeze, release, squeeze, release, squeeze, release. And those with smaller teats are harder to milk if you have a big hand, so not much there to grab onto. You'll know when the cow is milked out because you'll run out of milk. The milk will quit coming out. It's important to milk a cow every 12 hours. Keep them on its schedule. If one was to milk the 40 cows by hand, it would take um, 10 to 15 minutes per cow. So if we get four cows an hour, you'd be milking forever, <laughs> all day. My name is Gene Anderson. I'm a dairy farmer from Sargent, Minnesota. And I know how to milk a cow by hand. And I hope now that you know how to milk a cow by hand. Do you remember getting that model train set as a kid? Well, for some of us, that hobby never grows old. As we leave you this week, we will give you a free rail pass to board the California Zephyr as we take a look at the impressive layout of a model train club in Grand Meadow. See you next week, Off 90.
Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.